Historians, this is the 3.05 lesson, Transfer of Power. Remember to go to Lesson Resources before you begin and grab your needed materials. You can read through the objectives for the lesson. And then you will also need your reading guide, your lesson answer key, and there's also an extra activity for how many and where. So be sure to grab those before you begin. And let's get started by going through the lesson. The election of 1800 started with the nasty mudslinging campaign and resulted in a tie in the Electoral College and 36 ballots in the House of Representatives before the new president was chosen. Some people encouraged President John Adams to refuse to give up his office. Others accused Alexander Hamilton of treachery. In some states, the militia was put on notice to be ready for violence when the results came in. But Thomas Jefferson took the oath of office on schedule without a fight and called for unity. The nation moved forward and westward, doubling in size and embracing new political ideas. Review the goals with this lesson to help you. Describe the nature and significance of the election in 1800. Identify demographic and economic changes during the United States in 1800. Demographic is referring to population and, and the, and the uh, differences in people. Trace the evolution of Jefferson's view of the presidency and of implied powers during his presidency and describe the campaign and election of 1800. Uh, so remember once again to get your materials that you need and we will begin with reading pages 216 to 226. So we're going to go now to the textbook and start here. Jeffersonian Republicanism. So we're going to be learning a lot about Thomas Jefferson and his ideas of government and how his presidency unfolded. The United States in 1800 was a deeply divided nation. The two political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, known simply as Republicans, though not the same party as the modern day Republican Party, bitterly opposed each other. Federalists feared that if Thomas Jefferson were elected as the new president, he would pave the way for the breakup of the fragile union. Republicans insisted that the Federalists were bent on tyranny. Why else would they support a standing army and navy, national debt, and new legislation against sedition? Meanwhile, your war in Europe kept statesmen and both parties worrying about how to protect American trade and defend against a possible European invasion. But in little more than a decade, the scene changed dramatically. By 1815, the original political parties were either on their way to extinction or had changed beyond recognition. Fearful predictions of the new republic's demise were replaced by bold confidence. From 1800 to 1815, during the administration of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the United States managed to progress from its shaky beginnings to a more secure democratic foundations. How did this all come about? As the presidential election of 1800 approached, political passions ran high. The Federalists and Republicans took sharply opposing stands on such central issues as freedom of the press, the proper role of the federal government, and the relationship of the United States to the great powers of Europe. The Federalists, who favored a strong central government and a standing army and navy, largely sided with Britain in its conflict with France. Under John Adams, a Federalist president, Congress had passed the Alien and Sedition Acts designed to clamp down on Republican opponents of Adams' foreign policy. At the same time, America fought an undeclared naval war against the French in defense of U.S. maritime trade. The Republicans, who favored France, argued that the Alien and Sedition Acts violated the Constitution's guarantees of free speech. In a larger sense, they believed that the federal government was illegitimately grabbing powers not granted to it under the Constitution. In the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions of 1798 and 99, Republican leaders declared that the states had the right to nullify, that means not follow, laws passed by Congress, and in the opinion of the states, the laws gave the federal government powers not specifically stated in the Constitution. Another source of conflict for Republicans and Federalists arose from the Constitution's lack of provisions for political parties and an evolving American political system that was increasingly defined by them. In the, 19, in the 1796 presidential election, the Federalist candidate, John Adams, had received the highest number of electoral votes. But by the terms of the Constitution, the man who received the second highest number of electoral votes became Vice President, Adams' major political opponent, Thomas Jefferson. As Vice President, Jefferson complained that Adams cut him out of power and described the period of Federalist rule as a reign of witches. The death of George Washington in 1799 made matters worse by removing from the scene the greatest living symbol of national unity. Now a new presidential election loomed, pitting the 
pitting the incumbent president, John Adams, against Jefferson. Many Americans wondered if a peaceful change of power was possible, given the heated passions on both sides. They were all too aware of what happened in France when a revolution to establish Republican government had collapsed into the bloody reign of terror. The election of 1800. Jefferson and Adams have been friends since the days of the Revolution when they served on the committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence. Now they were rivals in a bitterly contested election. Presidential candidates in 1800 did not run for office as they do today, traveling about the country, giving hundreds of speeches and shaking thousands of hands. Instead, they stood for office, as the saying was. Adams remained at home on his farm and then in Washington, while Jefferson spent the long election season at Monticello, his mountaintop home in Virginia. But Jefferson was not idle. He wrote hundreds of letters and pamphlets for circulation in Republican newspapers, and he called on James Madison to do the same. The campaign was waged in the pages of the popular press. Republican papers accused Adams of being more British than American, a tyrant who wanted to be king, and even quite mad. In turn, Federalist newspapers labeled Jefferson a Jac Jacobin, a reference to the French radicals who had instigated the reign of terror. They accused him of atheism and spread rumors that if Jefferson were elected, family Bibles would have to be hidden so they would not be confiscated by the government. Partly because of divisions within the, the Federalist ranks, for example, Alexander Hamilton turned against Adams, the Democratic Republicans won the election. But it was not a certainty that Jefferson would become president. Both Jefferson and his running mate, Aaron Burr of New York, won the same number of electoral votes. Under the Constitution's ground rules, the tie would have to be broken by the House of Representatives, with each state's delegation casting one vote. Behind the scenes, both Jefferson and Burr worked first furiously for support. The tie was finally broken after Alexander Hamilton convinced key Federalist congressmen that Jefferson was preferable to Burr. While Hamilton vigorously opposed Jefferson's political views, he believed Burr to be dangerously power-hungry. Thus, with a tie broken, Jefferson was elected president. In the years after the election of 1800, political leaders tried to devise a way to avoid the deadlock that arose when Burr and Jefferson received the same number of electoral votes. The Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution, ratified in 1804, provided a simple solution. The amendment stated that henceforth electors would cast separate votes for president and vice president. This ensured that candidates were clearly designated as running for either president or vice president. And then you can read about Hamilton and Burr's duel on your own. It's kind of a neat little extra part of history, how uh, Burr gets back at Hamilton and, and shoots him in a duel. The Revolution of 1800. In his inaugural address, Jefferson called for a new spirit of unity. He asked Americans to bear in mind that in every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. Later, looking back at his electoral victory, victory, Jefferson characterized it as a revolution of 1800. He said that it had been as real a revolution as a war of independence, though a wholly peaceful one. Jefferson knew that in recent past, attempts to establish republics had failed when the dissent led the violent overthrow of one regime, usually to be replaced by a dictator. Indeed, the presidential election of 1800 marked the first time in the history of modern republican governments that a popular election led the peaceful transfer of power from one party to another. In what sense could the election of 1800 be considered a revolution? It brought about at least a striking change in the style of American government. Jefferson was determined to put an end to what he saw as the undemocratic trappings of power assumed by the Federalist leaders. While Washington and Adams had ridden in carriages to their inaugurations, dressed in handsome suits and wearing swords, Jefferson dressed in plain clothes and walked from the boarding house where he had been staying. No extravagant parade accompanied the president-elect to the first inauguration held in Washington, D.C., the new capital. The nation's new capital itself required a relatively simple government. Unlike New York and Philadelphia, Washington at this time was little more than a backwater village. And its muddy roads, swampy environs, and mosquito-choked air made the most congressmen despise it. Yet Jefferson delighted in the location and lack of pretense. He thought this unassuming place a proper setting for a truly democratic government, entirely fitting for the modest, modest federal government he envisioned. Even after he moved into the unfinished executive mansion known as the President's House, Jefferson lived unpretentiously. He kept his pet mockingbird dick in a cage in his office and sometimes allowed him to fly around the room. He treated visitors with the spirit of democratic equality. When the British ambassador to the United Nations, United States came to present himself, he was shocked to be greeted by a president wearing casual clothes and worn-out carpet slippers. The ambassador complained that Jefferson had no respect for rank. Jefferson's democratic attitudes went beyond symbolism. 
He showed a genuine concern for the lives and problems of ordinary Americans. He let it be known that anyone could write to him with suggestions or complaints, and thousands of letters poured into his office. He took the time to read every one. Except for the letters that were simply insulting, like the one that began, Thomas Jefferson, you are the damnedest fool that God put life into. He answered them all, courteously and helpfully, in his own hand. But Jefferson's democratic spirit ran into contradictions in the matter of slavery. In drafting the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson had helped sow the seeds of slavery's eventual destruction when he wrote that all men are created equal. After the American Revolution, most northern states passed laws to end slavery. Jefferson was well aware of the growing sentiment against slavery, both in the United States and Europe, and even shared it. But Jefferson remained a southern planter whose livelihood depended on slave labor. Throughout his presidency and beyond, Jefferson continued to own slaves, even as a growing number of his countrymen argued that slaveholding was immoral. Jefferson was not alone in his inconsistency. Some other southern planters were caught in a similar contradiction, championing American's democratic spirit, even when they tried to justify owning slaves. And here is an excerpt of his inaugural address. You can read that on your own as well. Jefferson's Assault on Federalism in his 1801 inaugural address, Jefferson promised a wise and frugal government. He made good on this pledge by reducing the national debt and cutting the sides of the federal government. Acting on the traditional Democratic-Republican suspicion of large standing military, he reduced the army from 4,000 to about 3,200 officers and enlisted men and sliced the navy down to six frigates on active duty. To Jefferson's way of thinking, a large navy might tempt the United States to rely too heavily on foreign commerce. He cherished the vision of America as a self-sufficient agrarian republic with most people engaged in what he considered the noble occupation of farming rather than the occupations of manufacturing and trade. Jefferson's initial policies added up to a sharp break from those of Federalists, who had sought a strong federal government and supported the growth of industry. In other ways, the difference turned out to be not as great as Jefferson promised. He had criticized the Federalist leaders for rewarding their political allies with government jobs. But as president, he did exactly the same, filling the government with loyal Republicans. When Jefferson's pre presidential predecessor, John Adams passed the Alien Sedition Acts to punish critics of the Federalist government. Jefferson had condemned the acts for violating the right to free speech. But when Federalist newspapers savaged President Jefferson, he encouraged officials to prosecute the editors for the crime of seditious libel. Convinced that political parties were evil, Jefferson believed the Democratic Republicans alone represented the legitimate voice of the American people. The Republicans are the nation, he insisted, but the Federalists continued to dominate the court system. The Power of the Judiciary before leaving office, outgoing President John Adams had appointed as many Federalist judges as he could. In February 1801, the lame duck Federalist Congress passed a Judiciary Act. This act created new regional courts as well as posts for 16 new judges and numerous judicial, judicial officials. Adams worked quickly to fill the slots. The appointments infuriated Jefferson. The Republicans called these new judges midnight judges because so many were appointed within days before Adams left office, including the, a few the night before. Adams' most important judicial appointment was former Secretary of State John Marshall to the post of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. A fellow Virginian and distant cousin of Jefferson's, John Marshall was a fierce, um, was a prominent Federalist. Jefferson fumed over the fact that Adams had appointed Marshall after losing the election of 1800 and that the Senate had confirmed him. Jefferson's most frustrating encounter with Marshall was the case of Marbury v. Madison. Two days before Jefferson took office, Adams had appointed William Marbury as Justice of the Peace for the District of Columbia. But in their haste, Adams' administration's officials had failed to deliver Marbury his official commission. Jefferson instructed his new Secretary of State, James Madison, not to confirm the appointment. Marbury then sued the administration. He took his case directly to the Supreme Court, which had jurisdiction under the Judiciary Act of 1789. In a precedent-setting case, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled against Marbury, but Marshall did not hold that Marbury's appointment was illegal. Rather, he said the Constitution did not give the Supreme Court authority over this case. Speaking for a unanimous court, Marshall explained that the relevant portion of the Judiciary Act exceeded the powers granted to the Supreme Court in the U.S. Constitution. With that ruling, Marshall apparently handed Jefferson a victory, but in fact he asserted an important power for the Supreme Court, which was held it has held ever since, the power of judicial review, which is a court's right to rule on the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress or actions undertaken by the administration. 
Marshall thus began a career that profoundly shaped constitutional law and established the judiciary as an equal partner with the legislative and executive branches. Though Jefferson desperately wanted to impeach him, Marshall presided over the court for the next 34 years, serving as chief justice under six presidents and strengthening the power of the Supreme Court at nearly every turn. Jefferson did succeed in naming some Republican judges to new posts, but in the court system, Federalist thinking and leaders remained the most influential force.